If you would, go ahead and be turning in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 119. And I will be picking up in verse 33 and go through 40. I'll do this next paragraph. Um, you may recall it's been a while because I only do this about once a month. But I've been working our way through since verse 1 of this chapter. So I'm going to keep going on the next paragraph here. And uh, I missed doing this last Sunday, or uh, last month, because of Christmas. And I kind of felt like I wanted to do a different Christmas-type message concerning this here. So I'd like to pick up then here. And um, as I do this, let me bring us up to speed before I read our scripture this evening. Um, but some of you may have not been with us. You may have uh, been in, you may have been out, and you may have come regularly, you may have not, but... As I said, for the past few months, I've been starting in verse 1, doing Psalm chapter 119. And um, Psalm 119 is very interesting. It's 176 verses long. It's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. Um, it also is composed of 22 sections or paragraphs. And each of these sections begins with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. In your Bible, it may say above verse 1, it have a funny-looking X-type symbol and have the word Aleph. And above verse 9, it may have another symbol and have the word Beit. And then above verse 17, it will say Gimel. These are just Hebrew letters of the alphabet. And what the writer has done here is to make it easy for the Israelites to memorize and being a work of poetry, he has, under the inspiration of God, composed each of these paragraphs to where the first word of every verse begins with that letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So then we come here to verse 33. And uh, it'll be clear as I go through this that the theme of Psalm chapter 119 is easy if you read through it. It is all about the Bible. It's all about the Word of God. He uses different words for it. The law of God, the statutes of God, the commandments of God. It's all what we would call the Bible. This psalm is nothing but a praise to God for giving him the Bible. It's nothing but a, a plea to God that God would help him have more of the Bible in his heart and in his mind. It's nothing more, it's nothing less than just all about the Bible. So isn't that ironic that in all of the Bible, the longest chapter in all the Bible is about the Bible itself? I think that shows how important God felt the Bible should be for us. So we come here to verse 33 to our next letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Again, before I read this, let me share with you what's interesting about this one. I'm giving you a little background, but it's really interesting if you know this. This letter here is pronounced hey, it looks like he, but in Hebrew, it is the letter, when you put it in front of a word, that implies what is called an imperative. It's as if I say to you, you must do this. You must do something. If I were to call out to you and I need help, I would be imposing upon you that I must have your help. That's called an imperative. It, it's, it is imperative that you do something. So every verse is going to begin with a verb that is a cry out for something, an imperative cry that he have help for something. So we'll see how that's interesting as we go. But if you would, then I'd like for us to stand for the reading of our scripture. And I'll begin in verse 33. And I believe um, Miss Jessie has got it up on the screen too if you need to follow along. But it reads in Psalm 119, verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it to the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity and revive me in your ways. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. Revive me through your righteousness. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our Father God, we thank you for the privilege to be able to come again as we do so uh, week to week and service to service to worship in this building that you have blessed us with, you have given us the finances, the means, the labor to be able to have what we have today. And God, I, I do thank you for what we have been able to get here recently and 
by way of uh, our building and the technology. But Lord, we know it all comes from your hand. So thank you, Father, for what you've blessed us with. I pray, Lord, that you would guide us, direct us to be faithful stewards of everything that you have given us. And Lord, I ask that prayer right now for me, that you would guide and direct me to be a faithful steward of ministering out your word to these good people that have come tonight, Lord. Pray, Father, you give me the grace to be able to stand and preach the truth, that I would be clear that you would open their hearts, Lord. And I, only, I know it's your Holy Spirit that is the only power in the force that can drive home the message into the hearts, Father. God, I pray as we go through this that if there is any here that may be without Christ as their Savior, that you would impose upon them an imperative, urgent need to make him their Lord and Savior. In your precious son's name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. In Psalm 119 here, as I said, it has the imperatives. There's ten imperatives to God. The writer calls out to God with an imperative plea. God, you must do something. You must help. And it's not until we get to the very last verse that we will see him declare what he will do. He meaning the writer of this. So there's a, an emphasis in this paragraph of what we usually see in the Bible is the writer will say, I will do this, I will do this because I love God. Well, now we see a twist. And he turns and says, God, you must do this, you must do this because of, and we'll go through that. So just keep that in your mind as we go. It's a very different psalm from what we're probably used to. Let me introduce with getting your minds to think about my theme for this. When I was a college student or before I was going into college, and if any of you went to college, you'll know what I'm talking about, but you usually more times than not have to fill out an application. And in that application, they will ask the question, why do you want to attend our university? And if you're trying to be cunning and cool about it, you try to twist your answer about how, well, your university is the only one that can make me do what I want to do, go where I want to go, you know, really try to impress them about how, the, you know, I only want to go to your school even though you've applied to five different ones, but to everyone you're telling them, I only want to go to yours because it's yours that can make me who I want to be. Um, so students are concerned about trying to get in to where they want to go be educated. Um, trying to gain acceptance into a school, or it could be a program, maybe it's a trade school, but if you ever go to, for those things, you have to be accepted in. Um, also, I want to say here that I believe this section, this paragraph, these verses here, 33 through 40, I believe it looks to us and it asks us the heart-piercing question to our core is, have I, have you begged God to accept us into his school? Because you see, we get so concerned about our jobs, Maybe we want to do well, we want to do better, we want to get promoted, we want to, maybe you're you know, older in your job and you're concerned about, well, can I retire out the way I really want to go? Can I live the dreams I've been working for for you know, 40 years and so on and so forth? We're concerned about these things, and rightfully so. These are responsible concerns to have a job, to do well, to grow in it, to advance, to be able to live in retirement, to be responsible with your money. Um, youth, maybe out of high school, they get concerned about, well, where am I going to go after high school? What am I going to do with my life? Will I go to school? Will I go get a job? How will I advance? What path should I take? You see, it's natural for us to be concerned with those things, and those are not bad things to be concerned with. We must be concerned with those. But we're so emphasis on trying to be concerned with those throughout our life, I'm trying to ask the question of myself and you, and I believe this paragraph does it. It asks us, though, do we intentionally beg God? Do we intentionally seek for God to invite us into his school? Do we ever turn to God and ask of him that he guide us and direct us on the path he would have us go? That he would take over for us, that he would move us how we need to be, to advance where we need to advance? Do we ever beg him that he accept us rather than be concerned with a boss accepting us, a colleague, a whatever, a school. So I want to ask it in that way. Think about that. You know, do we ever get concerned about how we can understand the Bible more tomorrow? Is that ever a question we ask ourselves? 
in the Sunday school class this morning and last week, I was uh, trying to share a brief summary of kind of maybe some better Bible study tools and habits that you could develop. Um, it's trying to answer the question, you know, how, how can we just be better students of the Bible? Um, and interestingly enough, I felt that my sermon tonight, the way I'm going to present it, if you were here this morning, Dad shared a, a, thought a great sermon from Ephesians. But Dad's main point was about how Paul says that we need to tap into the riches of God for the inner man, not for worldly things and all this. So that tie in there, Dad was saying, or rather Paul was saying in Ephesians, be concerned about the inner self, be concerned about seeking God's riches to better your inner self. I'm saying here with this psalm that this is in a way directed to that. It answers the question, how do I do that? How do I get these riches of God? And I don't mean like monetary riches and health and wealth. I mean spiritual riches. How do I tap into God's riches he has for his children? How do I go about, really the key question is, how do, how do we go about advancing in the Bible? Because I hope I can show you it all depends on how you treat the Bible. Now, that's my question. How do we go about advancing in the Bible? Well, I want to give you kind of three main points with this. And if you look in verse 33 and 34, I believe this addresses the issue here. Here's what we need first. We need divine understanding to live the Bible. We need divine understanding to live the Bible. Look at verse 33 with me. Now remember, he is directing this to God. He says, so to God, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes. But to teach means he's saying to God, instruct me. Instruct me in the way or the path of life that I must go on to follow your statutes, to follow your law. Statutes here is just simply the Bible. It's, another, it's a synonym for it. He is saying, we would say then, he is turning to God and asking God, God, you teach me. You instruct me on how I can conform my life to fit your standards, to follow your word, your way. And then he says, and I shall observe it to the end. I shall follow it. I shall make it my path in life until the end of what? Till the end of his life on this earth. It will be the entire direction of his life. If God will teach him how to conform his life to the Bible, he will make it the point of his entire life until the day of his death. Verse 34, he kind of repeats this. Give me understanding. So now he's asking for understanding. To teach kind of meant he needs instruction. He needs the knowledge. Understanding means he needs wisdom and discernment. You see, you can have knowledge, but you might not know how to use your knowledge rightly. So he's asking for the knowledge, and now he's asking for the understanding to use his knowledge. So God, give me understanding that I may, what? Observe your law. Law here, Hebrew word Torah, is the most comprehensive word in the Hebrew language that meant all of God's teaching. So what would we call that? The Bible. In his own way, he is saying to God, give me the knowledge, give me the understanding, give me the wisdom, give me the know-how to change my life, to conform it to the Bible. And then what does he say he will do? He says, I'll make it the goal of my entire life. I'll observe everything I can in your word. So, again, he is saying we need divine, from God, understanding, knowledge to live out the Bible. He would be saying to us then, notice how he says what he will do after God grants him this knowledge, as I've already said. After God grants it, he will change his life for it. Here's what I want to make a point to you for. It first of all starts with a desire. You have to have a want to to understand the Bible more. So let me ask you, do you have that? Do you even in the first place have a desire, have a want to, to want to understand the Bible more? It's a serious question. You see, if you just only come here once a week, some of you come twice a week, maybe three times a week, if that's it, if that's the only Bible being thrown at you, I would say it shows a pretty weak answer that you have of how much you care about knowing the Bible. What is your daily habits about? Does your life show that you are concerned with knowing more about it? Because this guy was. He is crying out to God almost, almost in a way giving God a command, saying, God, you must help me. You must give me the understanding. Why? So I can 
do this more. Obey this more. But it starts with that desire. And then you also must have the right motives. Now what I mean here is you have to know how to live. You, you have to have the right motives to know how to live a life in obedience to God and to know him more. Those can be the only motives you must have. You see, people may want to know the Bible more because they think they want to be a scholar. Maybe they think it makes them feel like they're superior to other people. But notice what he says here, why he wants to know. It was to observe it to the end and to keep it with all of his heart. So what are the motives we must have? Our motives for wanting to know the Bible must be only to know how to live our lives, to conform it more to the Bible, and to know the God of the Bible more. Do you have those motives? Do you seek daily to know your God more through the Bible? Do you seek to understand more how to live this Bible, to be pleasing to God? Because those were his motives, and those are the only pure motives anyone can have, including myself. And it, I want to tell you, that's a real personal danger I face, and I'm sure Dad faces it. You know, we're teachers and we're preachers, and I know it can be tempting for, the temptation for us is to feel like we have some sort of, of knowledge and, and higher level of understanding. That's not always the case. We are like you. We are fellow Christians. We just have been given a different gift of how we exercise our knowledge with the Bible. But our motives must be the same. Not to be better than you, not to be superior to you, not so I can stand here, but so that I can know my God more, so that I can obey it more. And my gift is to be turned around and given back to you to help you do the same. No more. But do you have that? So we need God. Here's what I want you to get from these first two verses. We need God to grant us, and Dad was big on that this morning. Remember in Ephesians 3, Paul said he prayed that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory. It had to be God transferring, giving it to you. Well, he is saying the same thing here. He's turning to God and saying, God, you must teach me. You must give me understanding. So we need God to grant us the knowledge so that we can live it. Because you can only obey what you understand. You can only obey what you first understand. If you don't understand it, you can't obey it. So where does understanding come from? It only comes from God. Again, that was his plan here. He turns first to God. God, teach me. God, give me understanding so that I can do this. I can live like that. But who did it start with? It started with God. So, again, do you depend on God? Do you call out to God for this understanding, for this knowledge? And I just want to challenge you personally. As I've dealt with people, and Dad may have dealt with it more being in the ministry more, but I've already noticed in my brief time, whenever I've talked with people, more so around my age, who say they just don't understand the Bible. They just, they don't get it. So they end up not really reading it, not really taking the time to dig into it. But my simple question is, especially after I've studied Psalm 119, have you ever asked that God would help you understand? And sometimes I get these deer in headlight looks, like I can do that? God will actually give me understanding? Well, actually, that's the only way you can get understanding. It starts with asking. So let me ask you, is it hard? Is it tough? Have you asked? Have you turned to him and said, Lord, teach me. Grant me this understanding. But again, I'm stressing that your motives must be to live more like Christ, as he says here, to observe it, to be changed. So we need that divine understanding to live the Bible. That's the first thing we need about advancing in God's school, advancing in the Bible. Now, look with me at the next three verses. Here's my next point. We also need divine guidance to stay in the Bible. We need divine guidance to stay in the Bible. In verse 35, he says, talking to God still, Make me walk in the path of your commandments. Why? For I delight in them. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to dishonest gain. So he starts off with saying three things here in this verse, or this next three verses. Make me walk in the path of your commandments. The path of your commandments, think of it in Hebrew, it's referring to a path in the grass that has been hardened down by footsteps going across a particular path. 
It's a footpath that has been trodden down in the grass. So he says, that path, the path that your Bible tells me to follow, make me walk in that path. Walk meaning his course of life, his daily living. He's saying, God, make my daily life be conformed to the way your Bible tells me to live it. Why does he want to do that? Because he wants to. He says, for I delight in it. Notice he doesn't feel like he has to. He doesn't feel like he must. He wants to. Is that not the sign of a truly changed heart by God? You see, even sometimes as Christians, I think maybe we feel like, oh, we have to try to keep the Bible. We have to do this. Let me tell you, you, don't, you should never feel like you have to do anything. Rather, if you're truly a child of God, you will want to do everything. He is saying here, I delight in this. He is basically saying, God, tell me what to do. I want to be told what to do. Do any of you like to be told what to do? Most of us don't. But he wants to be told what to do by God. Why? Because he loves him. And he knows that it must be through the Bible that he gets his instruction. So he needs this divine guidance, though, to stay in the Bible. He needs God to guide his walk, his path, to stay in the commandments of God. And now in verse 36, now he says, God, incline my heart to your testimonies. And he says here, God, spread out my heart, turn my heart to the direction that you would have it go. The word heart here means his entire being, his will, his desire, his emotions, everything about his inner self, the non-physical part of you, everything about you, your emotion, your will, those things I just said, that's his heart here. So he's saying, God, take everything about me that's not physical, the immaterial parts of me, and turn them to the Bible, to your testimonies. So again, he is asking for this guidance from God to keep him in the word. And now what's he wanting to be turned away from? He says, and not to dishonest gain. Uh, the King James Version says, um, and not to covetousness. Uh, but I like this word here, dishonest gain, because the word actually means what he's asking God to lead him away from is not just to covet something, but rather the word literally means to seek something illegally, to gain something with violent force almost. So he's saying, God, turn my heart this way towards your word and turn it away from sinfulness and wickedness and dishonest gain. Turn me this way, get me away from that way. He's asking for this divine guidance to keep him in the word. Verse 37, turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. Now he's saying, turn, turn something else away, God. He is saying, my, my eyes, the things I see with, the things that guide my steps in life, turn those away from looking at vanity. If something is, is vain or it has vanity, it means it's worthless. And here it also means it's something that's false, something sinful, something that's, that's empty. It has no value. So he says, God, turn away my eyes from from considering following anything that's worthless, that's sinful, that's not useful for you, that's, that's just vain, that has no value to you. Turn my eyes away from those. Again, this is under him asking for that divine guidance. So he asked for God to grant him the knowledge, the understanding, so he could do it. Now he's saying, God, turn my heart away from sinfulness, turn my eyes from looking at sinfulness. He's asking for the guidance so he can stay in the Bible. So then we need guidance from God to remain strong in the Bible. Why am I stressing this? Because I also think as Christians sometimes we can get into the Word, we can study the Word, and then we think that once God gets us through the first step, where we start to understand a little bit more, we start to grow a little bit in the Bible, we turn away from depending on God as much and start depending on ourselves because we think, oh, I'm understanding more now. I can keep this going. But rather, he says, God, I need the knowledge and the understanding, step one, and then I need you to keep me going through the rest of the way, step two. It is total dependence upon God to direct and guide him to stay in the Bible. Now then, we can both, I want you to get this too, we can both be satisfied when we obey the Bible, but have you ever noticed that we can also feel guilty when we disobey the Bible. And what I mean is, 
when we approach Scripture, I believe it does two things that he's saying here. If we obey it, I feel a drawing more to read it more. It's like I want to go to it more. It makes me feel better. It, it instructs me. It teaches me. But if I've had some sin I'm dealing with and I come to the Bible, there's just times it makes me feel downright ashamed. I believe he is stressing some of this here. God, I need your word to keep me going on that path, to encourage me, to guide me, and to direct me. What else can the Bible do? It can convict. It can guilt us when we approach it. But we need that. That is how God guides us in the word to keep us in the word. So we need God's guidance through the Holy Spirit and the word to keep us strong in the word. Well, what else do we need? Verse 38. Then he says, we need divine protection. We need divine protection to grow in the Bible. Look with me at verse 38. Now he says, establish your word, or that word there, word, can mean promise. Establish your word to your servant as that which produces reverence for you. Now this verse, in my opinion, is one of the most critical verses in all the Bible. And I am not going to be able to do it justice in just a couple of minutes. But think with me about this. Notice what he is saying. He has just come to God and says, establish your word. What does he mean? He means he wants God to take the Bible and to confirm it in his heart, confirm it in his mind, and to have it come true before his eyes. All the promises, all the things that's said there, he says, God, establish it. Make it be real to me. Make it live out in front of me. Let me see it play out before me, what you said you will do in your word. But then here's the next thing. He says, to your servant, which actually means slave, as that which produces reverence for you. Reverence there is actually translated fear in the King James, and I like that word. It's that holy fear of God because of God's attributes, God's holiness. So he says, as that which is the fear of you. So n notice what he's saying. He is saying, God, take your word, establish it in front of me, make it true, make it strong, let me see it, let me love it, establish it, bring it out before me. Why? He says, as that, that meaning the word, as that which produces reverence or a holy fear for you. Now, why do I say that's critical? What he has just said is if you want to grow more in God, if you want to have more reverence and awe for God, do you know the main way that happens? You must come through the Bible. Now, for many, I don't believe we realize that. We think it's maybe more prayer. Maybe it's just thinking about God more. Maybe it's just listening to a preacher more. But he says to God, establish this Bible more in my life as sure and firm because it's only the Bible that produces within me more reverence and fear for you, God. Do you ever see the Bible as the means that God uses in your life to draw you closer to him? Do you ever see the Bible as what God uses in your life to produce more reverence and awe for him? You see, I think sometimes we look for signs and wonders. We look for the God in the Old Testament, and he's still the same God today, but we read the stories about God parting the Red Sea and God doing the plagues in Exodus, and we say, I need to see these signs, God. But what did he ask for? He just said, I just want to know more about your word because this is what produces more reverence and fear and awe for you. This book, that's how important this Bible was to him. Now, why am I saying here that this is called divine protection? He is saying if he wants to grow in the Bible, grow closer to God, he needs God's divine protection over him to keep him in this word, establish this word to him more surely, to keep him in it, to grow him in it. Verse 39 says it more. He says, turn away my reproach, which I dread, for your ordinances are good. So the next thing he asks for is for God to turn away do away with his reproach. Reproach meaning his contempt. Now, to be honest, there is disagreement among much smarter people than I over what this verse means. Some say that this verse means he is asking for God to protect him from other people who are ungodly people, who are trying to attack him, perhaps even physically, 
uh, people who are seeking him because he is a godly man. So he's saying, God, protect me from that reproach because these people hate me because I follow your word. They're reviling me. They're cursing me because of who I am in you, God. So on the one hand, he's saying, protect me from opposition. But I believe there is an equally good interpretation, and I'm actually going to believe both of what I'm about to say are true. I fully believe what he is saying is he needs divine protection from God from outside opposition because Scripture teaches us clearly that all who desire to live a godly life will be what? Persecuted. I don't, that doesn't always mean physically, but it can mean we're ostracized. It can mean we're reviled, we're jeered at, the loss of a job, loss of close family members. We will face some sort of outside persecution for trying to live according to the Bible. He is saying, God, I face that. Turn away that reproach from me. Protect me from it. Because I believe that what he faces is the temptation to stop obeying the Bible as much. You see, it's easy to give in to the reproach and say, well, I'm not going to be as open about my Christian walk. Then maybe they won't make as much fun of me at work. I mean, it is just my job after all, right? I don't have to be as open about God there. That's not what they pay me for. No, he is saying, God, I want to stay strong in the word. Get me through this reproach. Now, on the other hand, I believe he's also equally saying, turn away his reproach. Turn away his guilt from inward sin. You see, when you and I sin, we fall into sin, there is a sense of guilt and shame that we bear when we come to the Bible. That is a reproach to us. It's a reproach to our soul. I believe he is saying both things. Turn away my outside opposition, and God protect me from myself, from my sinful flesh. The sinful flesh can keep him from trying to live according to the Bible fully. So again, he needs God's protection for him to keep growing in the Bible. He says because his ordinances are good, or the Bible is good. Good means several things. Good means that he likes it, it's good to him. Good meaning it's actually holy and righteous. This book is not just a book, it is a good book. And that does not mean it is just good to our feelings. It means it is a righteous, holy good book. And he is saying, God, I need to be protected to stay in this because this is what is good. This is what is righteous. So that is his request to God. Um, and I hope you see what he's saying, how every verse is him calling out to God. It is him almost imposing an imperative command on God. God, you must do this. You must do that. But his motives are pure. His motives are so that I can be more like you, so that I can live more according to your word. Well, what is he saying again to us here with these last two verses? We need God's protection in order to both be protected from outside opposition and from our own sinfulness, is what I believe he is saying here. So those are the three main things I believe he is saying. How do we advance in the school of God? How do you and I, as children of God, advance in the Bible? How do we grow in it? It starts with, have you even asked God for divine understanding so that you can live it? Have you asked God for the divine guidance to keep you on the path of following the Bible? And have you asked God for that divine protection so that you can stay in this and grow in this? And I want to close with verse 40. If you would look at that one with me. Verse 40 is the oddball verse because the rest of these verses have began with him saying to God. And now if you look, he begins by saying what he will do personally he, or what he desires. He says, Behold, I long for your precepts. Precepts meaning God's laws, God's commands. Again, another word for the Bible. So he's saying, God, I desire, I want more of the Bible. Revive me through your righteousness. So what is the basis for all of this? What is the basis of everything I've been saying about trying to know the Bible more, trying to grow in the Bible, developing more closeness to God and reverence for God through the Bible? What's the bottom line of all of that? It's verse 40. He says it starts with that desire. He says, I desire... I long for your precepts. 
your commands, your law, your word. And then he says, revive me through your righteousness. So two things. He longs and desires two things. He desires the Bible, the word of God itself. And then he desires the righteousness of God. He desires to know this book. And then why does he desire it? So that he can be more righteous like his God. And then he knows that it is through this book that holds the keys for him to grow more and be more righteous like God. That's the bottom line. So then my question would be, do you have that desire? Can you say verse 40 is your prayer? Is verse 40 the summation of your daily life? Do you wake saying, God, today, behold, I long for your word. I long for your righteousness. I believe in closing, I'd like to ask if there's any here who is not of Christ, I would ask you, who is Christ to you? If Christ is your Lord and Savior, then verse 40 must be your battle cry every day. You must have that desire. If Christ is not your Lord and Savior, then you perhaps have understood next to nothing of what I've just said. You don't have that desire. You don't cry out to God for understanding. You don't make the course of your daily life to grow in righteousness. You may not even know what righteousness is. You may not have any concept of forgiveness, of salvation, of the knowledge of God, of the life of God being in you, the Holy Spirit being in you. These may be foreign concepts. If Christ is anything less than your Lord and Savior, then this right here doesn't matter right now. It starts with having Him be your Lord and Savior. You must be one of Christ. You must have the forgiveness of your sins because you know that Christ is the only payment for your sins because you have offended Holy God. It starts there. Because only a true child of God, even during the hard times, must seek what the Bible calls the pure milk of the Word of God. Let me read you that in 1 Peter 2. He says, Therefore put aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. If, if, there is a condition, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Kindness of the Lord meaning the salvation from God through Jesus Christ. So I want to challenge you. I know I'm probably mostly speaking to the choir, but I want to be sure. If verse 40 is not your desire, are you even of Christ? And if not, that must be first. But if you are of Christ, I challenge you, make verse 40 your cry every day. And then verses 33 through the rest will begin to fall into place. You will seek that knowledge from God. You will desire that righteousness from God through the word. So remember that, how important the Bible was to him. As you go about your life, and as I do as well with my job, and as schools, wherever we go, retirement, whatever it may be, as you're seeking these things in life, do you take the time to seek this knowledge from God? Let's close in prayer. God, thank you for the time uh, that you have given me personally, uh, to be able to do this. God, I fully believe that I have the greatest job in the world and I can hope to do nothing better in life than to stand before your people and to declare to them your word. God, I'm so unworthy, but Father, you have granted me this calling and I pray, Father, and beg you, Lord, that something may have been said that will pierce the heart tonight, Lord. That your Holy Spirit would Take the word, apply the word into the hearts. And Father, I pray for every one of us here who are in Christ. I know myself, Father, studying this was very challenging to know that the very only way I can understand your word and grow in the word depends upon you. It depends on getting the knowledge from you, the protection from you, the guidance from you. I pray, Father, that as we start Monday, every one of us, Lord, who are your children, that you would impress upon us a greater desire to seek the knowledge from you from above, to grow in the grace of Christ, to live more like Christ through your Bible. 
God, I pray a special prayer on these people, Father, that as they do that, if they attempt that, Father, if they seek that from you, God, that you would just, as it were, give them a double portion of understanding of your word. Just flood their minds and their hearts with a love for the Bible and a greater understanding and a sincere desire to live it. Thank you for all the gifts you've given us and the blessings we have as a church body and personally in Jesus Christ. In your son's name I pray. Amen.